Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, brothers and sisters, and a special warm welcome to all our non Muslim attendees who we highly appreciate. Thank you all for coming to today's first lecture, one of many events that we have lined up for this week, for this Islamic Awareness Week, inshallah, and which God willing promises to be a very exciting one full of intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. This year, Islamic Awareness Week, will not be exactly one week. It's going to go for a little bit extra. It'll be one and a half week. That's how much events we try to pack in, inshallah. We will also be having a special joint event in the form of a debate with the EU, the Christian Society. Um, and this will be on next Monday. And further information on this event and all our other events are available on the website. That's sumsa.org.au forward slash IAW09. The last of all prophets was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the messenger revealed to him, the message revealed to him was the glorious Quran. It still exists today in the form that it was first revealed. And it remains the only true and authentic expression of God's guidance to humanity. God in His absolute mercy sent, sent us a prophet with revelation to guide us on the straight path and to correct our errant beliefs and way of life. Today's presentation delivered by Dr. Zachary Matthews entitled The Quran, A Guide in Uncertain Times. We will explore the inner secrets of the Qur'an as a book, as a book of guidance for all, especially in uncertain times as we are experiencing at the moment. Inshallah, without further ado, I will give you Zakhara Mathis. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nan. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk to you today. And uh, it gives me a pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you very much for coming and giving all your time to understand something about Islam and one of the uh, primary sources of uh, Islamic teachings and Islamic law. And um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to be addressing the non Muslims. For those of you who are Muslims, you will benefit anyway. So uh, forgive me for that. Um, I'm going to try and keep my presentation basic to cover the basis, uh, really the uh, fundamental uh, elements of the Quran, and see how the Quran can be a source of guidance uh, in uncertain times. Uh, now, uh, we know that we are living in uncertain times and we are all in search of certainty. Issues such as um, the GFC, global financial crisis, uh, terrorism, the arrest last week in Melbourne, issues of suicide uh, locally uh, in Australia. Just uh, on the radio this morning, I heard that the, uh, an organisation called Beyond Blue took the unprecedented step of um, seeking an um, injunction against 60 Minutes for um, uh, broadcasting a uh, documentary on five um, high school students committing suicide in recent times in, in Geelong. So, there are many issues uh, that is troubling us. So, this is a, a good opportunity for us to look at um, perhaps the, the, the most authentic of, of sources of guidance um, in existence today. And this is my outline. I'm going to cover the books of God just by way of introduction, and then I'm going to go into the these are the topics that I'm going to cover. The Quran, its style and content, uh, the two periods of revelation, the Meccan and Medinan revelations, looking uh, specifically at the compilation of the Quran, so that goes to its credibility and its authenticity, looking at the major themes contained within the Quran, and then just briefly towards the end, um, highlighting some of the divine challenges contained within the Quran which relate to its credibility and its authenticity. And then we'll finish with the final word on its guidance. 
So if we start out then by looking at the books of God, as was mentioned in the introduction, God in His ultimate and absolute mercy. Now for those of you who choose to believe in God, uh, that's, uh, that's your prerogative and for those of you who choose not to, then we hope that you can appreciate some of the concepts that we are presenting today. So in His mercy He sent us prophets to help us find true guidance and to find certainty in our lives. And it, it is because of His mercy that He chose not to leave us to our own devices. Because as we know, if humans are left to their own devices, we will wreak havoc in this earth. As we have in the past and undoubtedly as we will continue to do and we will do so in the future as well, despite God's mercy in sending us prophets and, and revelation and guidance. But had it not been for these prophets and revelation from God, we, we probably would have destroyed this planet a long time ago. So what he did was he sent uh, many thousands of prophets uh, who received prophecy from God. So these are the two types, uh, the, the prophets who received prophecy but not necessarily received a codified message and this is the second category. These are the prophets who received these codified messages, books, revelation and they are a subset of prophets that we call messengers because they were given not only prophecy but a specific, specific codified message that they needed to uh, relate and convey to their people. Now of these messengers and the revelation that they received, not every book was written down because as you can appreciate the, um, the, uh, the discovery of, of, of writing material um, didn't happen until much later if we take the beginning of time to be from prophet uh, Adam. So it was uh, predominantly at the beginning, it was oral transmission of this revelation, of these messages. And, and just um, to sidetrack slightly, that the main uh, message that was conveyed by all prophets, from Adam to Muhammad, peace be upon them all, was one, one single message, and that was to submit to the will of God. Submit to the will of God. And in that, God gave us choice whether to submit, to choose to submit, or choose not to. And obviously, we have to suffer the consequences based on the choice that we made. So where does all this revelation come from? The Qur'an tells us that there is a source book with God. And it's called Umul Kitab. It's the mother of the book. And it's from this book that revelation was taken and given to specific messengers. And it was only one angel that was responsible for the conveyance of this revelation from that book to these messengers. And that was the Archangel Gabriel. And he is therefore the angel of revelation. And so he is the same angel that brought revelation uh, to, to Jesus, to Moses, and to Muhammad, peace be upon him all. The Quran also mentions five of these books. We're talking about God's books now. These are the codified messages that were given to these select uh, prophets who were called messengers. These are the five that are specifically mentioned in the Quran, the scrolls of Abraham. In Arabic, they're called Sokhof. Uh, which is the plural of uh, Sahifa, the Law of Moses, the Torah, the, the Psalms of David, the Zabur, uh, the Gospel of Jesus, the Injil. These are the Arabic words in brackets. These are the Arabic words for these Arabic titles for these books. And the last is the reading of Muhammad the Quran. So these are the five books specifically mentioned in the Quran. So the question is, what happened to these books? But well, what happened to these messages that were given to these prophets? To start out, why was there a need to send a book after one had already been sent? And primarily the reason was each book was sent to correct previous distortions, not in the revelation, not in the book, but distortions that were made by subsequent followers of that messenger. So that's, that was the need for uh, books being sent uh, uh, periodical to correct those distortions and to bring people back to the original message which was to submit to God. So therefore only the final revelation when, uh, and therefore by default if you, if you use that formula then the final revelation which is the Quran remains in its original revealed form. The Quran. And this is a verse uh, from the Quran taken from chapter 12. It's the first verse. I will read the Arabic first. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألف تلك آيات الكتاب المبين 
Those first three letters, those are just Arabic, those are letters of the Arabic alphabet. And there, there are many hidden mysteries and secrets in, in the use of those particular letters as well. We don't have the exact meaning for uh, why God uh, in His infinite wisdom chose to, uh, to, to start out a particular chapter with just letters of the alphabet. It would be a book, and this is unique to the Quran as well, a book starting out with A, B, C before the first, as, as the first sentence, or uh, PQR, for example. And there are 14 chapters in the Qur'an that, that have that. And the scholars of the Qur'an tell us, it is God pointing out, pointing out to us that we have in our possession these 25 letters of the Arabic alphabet, yet we cannot take those letters, manipulate them, and come up with something similar to the Qur'an. Again, as proof to the divine nature of the book that we have. So that's one of the miracles of, of the Qur'an. And, and in, in fact, it's, it's, this is one of the challenges that God also presents to us. You have the letters of the Arabic alphabet, yet you cannot use them in a way to come up with words and sentences to match the Qur'an. And you never will. And I'll, I'll cover that towards the end of my presentation. So let's quickly look at what the Qur'an says about these previous books, and specifically about the Bible. The Quran states that the followers of Jesus and Moses subsequently distorted that authentic message that was given to both Jesus and Moses. Because the source is the same. The Quran teaches us that the source is one and the same. It was brought by the same angel, Gabriel. But the Quran tells us that the followers of not only these previous prophets distorted the message, all subsequent peoples before that. All uh, people before that. And also, if, uh, the Quran says that the, the Bible, for example, uh, the authors are unknown, did not exist in Jesus', Jesus time, so as a written document did not exist during his lifetime. The New Testament Gospels are biographies of his life that were written subsequent to his passing on. And therefore, the Quran also tells us, therefore, uh, as a result of this, that the followers of Jesus are misguided, since these holy books have been distorted or lost, and its followers have naturally deviated from God's message. That's not what I'm saying. That is what the Quran says. That is a declaration from the Quran. So you're welcome to take it up with me, uh, but I'm going to refer you back to the Quran. And this is the indictment, which is a, a, a Quranic indictment about that. It says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَى The Jews say the Christians follow nothing. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ and the Christians retort by saying the Jews follow nothing. And then the Quran says, yet they profess the same scripture to read and to understand and to follow the same book. Like unto their word is what those who say who know not. So basically the Quran is saying that they don't know what they speak of. But Allah will judge between them in their quarrel on the day of judgment. Okay, now all true believers, even those who may have deviated from that original message that was given to Jesus or Moses, the Quran tells us that they will recognize the truth of the Quran. If they are true believers, so if they have faith in their hearts, if the Qur'an is re recited to them, if the Qur'an is presented to them, they will recognize that this is a message from God. And this is the verse, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, qad ja'atkum mu'adatum min rabbikum, there has come to you a direction from your Lord, wa shifa and a healing, wa shifa un lima fi sudur, and a healing for the diseases in our hearts, and really it's these diseases in our hearts that cause us distress and uncertainty. And that's perhaps, that, that is perhaps the greatest uh, calamity that we, uh, we, we could suffer from, is uncertainty. Not being sure about who we are, why we are here, and where we are headed. وَشِفَاءُ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ وَهُدَى And a guidance, وَرَحْمَةً And a mercy to the believers. So for those who believe the Qur'an says, if they read the Qur'an, they will recognize that this is guidance and mercy, a guidance and a source of mercy from their Lord. Despite them having been uh, misled through distorted teachings. 
And that is our invitation to, 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 Muslim, to Christians and Jews today. That is my invitation to you, is to, to uh, approach the Quran to try and recognize that truth in it. If you truly believe in God, and if you truly believe in God, the Quran says that you will. You will find guidance, guidance in it. Okay, the Quran, uh, the Muslims believe that the Quran is the little word of God, and I will go through um, the credibility and authentication of that. The second of the primary sources of Islamic law is the Hadith. So, Muslims derive, with the, the scholars of Islam, jurists, will derive law, Islamic law, from two sources, the Quran and the Hadith. Another word for Hadith, the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So, the Hadith are the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it is it is a commentary on how to practically implement the Qur'an, the teachings of the Qur'an. So if you like, the Qur'an is the policy statements where guidelines are presented, and the Sunnah is the procedure document. So I, I work in the health industry and we have policies and procedures. And, and, and normally you, need, you have a policy statement first, and then you have the specific uh, procedures that need to be implemented to achieve that particular outcome in the policy. So this is the Qur'an and Sunnah. So how did it all begin? The story of Revelation is interesting. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was born in the year 570 Christian era. Just a footnote, uh, Muslims don't use AD. Why do Muslims not use AD? For those Muslims who are in the audience. Why do we use common or Christian era and not AD? Because we believe that Jesus has passed away. Exactly. The Muslims do not believe, as the Quran tells us, that Jesus did not die on the cross, that it was someone else who looked like him. That Jesus was taken to his Lord without dying. But this is how Revelation started. When the Prophet was aged 40, in the year, so he was born 570, 40 years later, in the year 610, common era, Christian era, uh, he was spending some time in a cave called Hira on the mountain of, of light. And this is when the Archangel Gabriel came to him, in the form of a man. And he instructed him and held him and said to him, Read, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladiqa, Read in the name of your Lord who created. The, the Prophet's first response is that he could not read. I cannot read. Now that is also testament to the fact that the Prophet was an unlettered Prophet. He could neither read nor write. But another interpretation of that is later, what should I read? The angel is asking me what to read, what should I read? And then the, uh, and the next verse is, is, is conveyed to him, Iqra wa rabbuka akram. Sorry, Khalaq al-insana min ala created the human out of a, a clot of congealed blood. Iqra wa rabbuka akram, read, and your Lord is most bountiful. Al-ladhi allama bil qalam, he who taught the use of the pen. عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Taught man that which he knew not. So those are the first five verses revealed to, to the Prophet. And he was in a state of shock when that happened to him, as you could imagine. And he went back to his wife Khadija and explained to her what happened. And she was the source of his first comfort. And she confirmed to him that he was a prophet as a result of what happened. And then the Qur'an was revealed piecemeal over a period of 23 years. It was not conveyed to the Prophet all in a long ago. And it was revealed over this 23 years for several reasons. And one of them perhaps is issues based. As the issues arose, they were revealed. But perhaps also because the Prophet, uh, because he was so uh, affected by that first incident of revelation, he needed to be strengthened first before he could uh, receive revelation. Because it was not an ordinary experience. And, and, and when, we're dealing with, when we're dealing with issues of the unseen and the metaphysical, then we, we don't have a lot of understanding and knowledge about it. But it's perhaps for that reason as well that it was revealed over a period of 23 years to make it easy on the Prophet himself. And another reason perhaps is that the community of believers needed to be transformed and this transformation needed to be gradual and staged over a period of time. You could not expect people to transform overnight. The word, the Arabic word Qur'an, literally means the reading or the recital. As I mentioned before, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was unlettered. He could neither read nor write. So what he did was, 
he dictated what was an oral transmission from Archangel Gabriel to him, was orally, orally transmitted, verbally transmitted to him, he dictated that to scribes, people who were able to read and write. And once, once these were dictated, he would write it down to them and confirm and check that they had uh, written it down correctly. So the Qur'an is made up of 114 chapters, 6,236 6, verses, if you, if you don't include Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, to 112 of those chapters. That is actually, I don't think we can see that picture. There was actually a, a town called Uncertain in the U.S. I think, it, I, I think it's in uh, Arkansas. I don't know how the, the people in that in town uh, consider themselves to be. Whether, whether they consider themselves to be uncertain, but who they are. Okay, the Quran. So how was revelation received by the Prophet and, and previous Prophets as well? The methods were perhaps the same and similar. Uh, and this is how some of the methods uh, occurred. Uh, inspiration in dreams at night. For example, uh, Prophet uh, and Messenger Abraham uh, received the instructions in his dream to sacrifice his son. Uh, Moses was speech, but hidden speech, from, from behind a burning bush. Uh, there is also, to the Prophet, peace, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, instantaneous revelation directly into his heart while he was in a state, state of wakefulness. And his, his wife Aisha would uh, uh, testify to that, that she would notice that something strange would happen to him. Or the Prophet would be uh, resting his leg, uh, or his head, resting his head on her leg, on her thigh, and it would uh, become so immensely heavy, the weight of his head. And then she would ask him when he awoke, what happened? And then he would explain to her that, that he had just received revelation. At other times it was really uh, um, uh, tough and difficult on the Prophet when it was foreshadowed by a loud ringing sound followed by the verses of revelation. And then most of the time it was direct speech, where uh, the, uh, the angel would transform. We have these movies today, Transformers. Right? You guys know about Transformers, right? So it's not a strange foreign concept, where angels can transform into and take the uh, human form. Right? So that happened 1400 years ago, and in fact it happened a lot longer before that. So uh, the, uh, Hollywood and the movie industry um, try to pitch these ideas. Um, <laughs> They're looking, for, they're looking for themes and topics and concepts, but they'll find them if they look, if they look closely enough, they'll find heaps of them. But the angel used to transform himself into the shape of a, of a man, and he would actually just converse and convey his revelation directly to the Prophet, peace be upon him. When the Prophet saw the angel, uh, Gabriel, in his actual form, he fainted. Because the angel, as it is reported to us by the Prophet himself, that angel Gabriel, uh, Gabriel in his actual created form is a frightening sight. He has uh, the wingspan, and this is where the movies come from, right? Uh, angels have wings, you, you've seen them, right? And that, that's perhaps true, they do have wings. Um, but the wingspan, the wingspan of Archangel Gabriel, his wingspan covers the entire horizon. The span of each of his wings covers the entire horizon from the east to the west. But he doesn't only have one wing, he has 600 wings. The Prophet only saw him twice in his actual form. And the first time it happened, he fainted. You can just imagine that sign. I'm getting I should stop making references to, uh, to Hollywood movies. But it's to convey the idea that these things uh, might seem uh, impossible, but um, they, they are. Okay, let's move on to the style and content of the Quran. Muhammad, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before Revelation was not a poet. Poetry uh, was one of the um, um, one of the pastimes that, that people used to excel in. And, and, and this concept of oral transmission and memory had reached its pinnacle during that, that particular time. We, we have since lost that ability over a period of 1400 years, we don't remember things anymore. But people 1400 years ago had an amazing memory. Uh, one of the collectors of Hadith, Imam uh, Bukhari, he reported, and, and he's one of the, uh, he has collected and reported the most sayings and statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So he has the largest collection of hadith, of statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It is reported that he said, whenever he heard somebody say anything for the first time, it would be reported in his memory. 
All he needed was to listen to something once and it would be recorded in his memory. If only our lecturers could uh, have this luxury with their students. Uh, or only if, if as students we could have this ability to remember things. But anyway, poetry and, and these poets, they would, they would uh, relate long, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, poems. But the Prophet himself did not excel in poetry. He, he was not a poet. It, it did not interest him. So, when looking at the style and content, non-Muslims have looked specifically at the, at the style and content of, of the Quran and the Arabic language in it. And they, they have declared that the, it is perhaps the greatest book in the Arabic language. You have loosely phrased metaphors, flowing text, engaging syntax, and in fact, when, uh, when Arabic um, uh, teachers, language teachers, need to teach grammar, they will use the Qur'an as a reference. I know some non-Muslims don't like to do that, um, because of the nature of uh, their relationship with Islam and the Qur'an. But in fact, they have no choice. They have to refer to the Qur'an for the rules of grammar. Because there's no other book in Arabic literature where the, the rules of grammar are exemplified to the, to the level it is in the Qur'an. There are also a variety of literary mechanisms used, and this is something new for me. I, I, I didn't realize that in, Arab, in the Arabic language there are so many different forms of literary styles and mechanisms. Apparently there are 18 different styles, uh, different mechanisms, and the Qur'an is the 19th. The Qur'an is neither of those 18 conventional uh, mechanisms. It is a, uh, an entirely new and when humans try to, to, to match that particular style, they cannot. And these are scholars of, of, of literature, of Arabic literature, if they try trying to, uh, to, to copy that mechanism, they cannot. So it has straight line by line, writing, meet, writing, flowing, prose, passionate essays, etc. Now, Western, Western critics, some critics, when they look at the Quran and they see that frequent transition between two, two, two different styles, or perhaps three or four multiple styles, they say that that is unconventional and perhaps distracting and confusing and uh, not, not a good way of presenting a message. So this is because it does not conform to the way we read books today. We start from the beginning and we, we, with a particular theme and a particular topic and it grows and uh, um, transforms to a particular story, through a storyline and it, it moves towards the end. However, Muslim scholars will say this in fact is the strength of the book. For two reasons. It allows ease of memorization uh, and also it allows those um, specialists who specialize in the recitation of the Qur'an. The, Qur'an. the recitation of the Qur'an itself is an art form. So it allows them to achieve uh, particular progress in their recitation of the Qur'an. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to present to you a sample of that recitation or that, or that particular art form. But let's move on anyway. We look at what is the content, and this is why we are here today. The, there are a variety of subjects. It contains uh, religious doctrine, uh, law, social values, morality, history, and science. But it's not a book of science. It's not a book of history. It's not a history book. It's not a science book, although it contains some of those themes or subjects within the book as a way to convince us of its core message, which is, it is a book of guidance. That, uh, that picture is the seal of the Prophet. That is the seal that he used uh, when any document or agreement needed to be signed. The Prophet himself could not read nor write. So some of the, one of the companions actually had that seal made for him and he used to use that seal. They used to use wax in the good old days if they had to sign documents. We still have it today. Uh, it's called the common seal. It's called the common seal today for companies and so forth. Okay, refuting some of the critics of, uh, regarding the authenticity of the Qur'an, um, the question of uh, whether the Qur'an is the uh, little word of God, the divine word of God. This is Dr. Morris Dupont, uh, where he actually became Muslim, subsequently. And he wrote several books on uh, the, the origin of man, and he wrote a book, The Bible, Qur'an and Science. And this is what he had to say. He said, how could a man, referring to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from being illiterate, he could neither read nor write, become the most important author in terms of literary merits in the whole entire uh, Arabic literature. And the Muslim answer to that is it is none other than direct revelation from God. Okay, let's move through the different periods of revelation and just look at that content and subject matter again. And there are two periods over that 23 year um, time frame. The first is 13 years in Mecca, that is when the Prophet from the age of 14 the age of about 53, spent his, his life in Mecca and he received revelation for those 13 years. 
Now, the marketing period is characterized by the environment being hostile to that fledgling new emerging uh, community of believers. They were few in number. The Quraysh, the tribe, uh, the Arab tribe in Mecca at that time were very hostile to the Prophet and his, and his followers. And this is the same treatment that was meted to all previous Prophets before him. Uh, when uh, the uh, Khadija took the Prophet after that first revelation to her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal, uh, uh, he was a Christian, uh, Christian uh, believer. And when the Prophet explained to him what happened to him, he said, that was the same angel that came to Moses before you. The same angel, what happened to you is what happened to Moses before you. And uh, if, I, if I'm alive, uh, I will follow you and defend you and support you when your people rise and revolt against you. So the Prophet asked him, will my people revolt uh, against me? He said, yes, because that's what happened to all previous prophets before. The two main themes contained in those verses revealed during the Meccan period, uh, confronting backward Arab customs such as infanticide, mostly burying their female daughters alive, superstition, blindly following their traditions, their, what they saw their forefathers doing, etc. And the second theme was pointing out the foolishness of idolatry. They were an idolatrous society worshipping idols, so Islam came with the monotheistic message to them uh, of worshipping only one God and not, not worshipping any idols. The, uh, that period also conveyed stories of previous prophets and the difficulties and the hardships that they went through. So that's where history comes into it. And that's important because it actually consoled the prophet uh, indicating to him that what's happening to him right now is not something new it happened to previous messengers and prophets of God so what he, all he needed to do was bear the, the burden of the responsibility of his, his mission then the second period was the Medinan period 10 years in Medina this is when the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina after it was established that they could no longer sustain their community in Mecca they were invited to relocate, to migrate to another city in Saudi Arabia. It's about an eight hour bus drive, I think. Yeah. It's about an eight hour drive, bus drive, it's about an hour by plane from uh, Mecca to Medina and so forth. Um, and they were, they were invited to establish their community in Medina. And uh, so that particular period was characterized by the Prophet and his followers establishing the Islamic State. Uh, in, in that city, and that was the first Islamic state established. And the main theme of the verses conveyed uh, the messages of how to build an Islamic society, so issues about values, law. Um, so these were things that were not covered in the first period. During the Meccan period, very little, pro no prohibitions were, were, were mentioned. So the prohibition of alcohol came in the second period. Um, so basically, that first period was uh, a period where the, the verses referred to the issues of faith. Believing in God, believing in the angels, believing in the prophets, believing in, in life after death, believing in heaven and hell. And then when, uh, when the believers were fully uh, convinced of that, and their, their faith was strong and deep, then they could sustain the prohibitions and, uh, and, and the law with regard to uh, prohibition of alcohol and so forth. But interestingly, the verses in that period also covered diversity management and pluralist uh, relations with uh, Christians, with Jews and peoples of other faith and uh, idol worshippers and so forth and, and the prohibitions as I mentioned so if we, if we just backtrack a little bit and look at uh, go back to what I mentioned that when Archangel Gabriel came and he presented the message it was an oral transmission the Prophet then went uh, to these scribes there were uh, 20 uh, of them um, who were engaged in this particular practice and these were the uh, materials that they used this was what they had at their disposal at that time. China had not yet uh, discovered um, paper and uh, the method of making paper and, and so they did not have any, any access to paper but they did use Egyptian parchment, uh, leather scrolls, camel shoulders, the shoulder blades that were used as slaves. And the entire collection of all of these, the entire collection of the Qur'an as it was revealed from Archangel Gabriel to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, that whole collection was contained in one large leather bag at the death of the Prophet peace be upon him, at the time that he passed on. But the other interesting thing is that memorization by followers was strongly encouraged, so not only was it dictated and written down, but followers were encouraged to memorize the verses of the Quran, so to put to memory everything that was revealed. And as I mentioned before, they had reached the pinnacle of poetry and memory. Um, and 
And so this was not something uh, hard for them to do, to actually to put to memory the verses of Revelation. So they excelled at doing that, and, and hundreds of companions were able to do that. And hundreds of them were able to memorize the entire Quran from, from the beginning, beginning to the end. So this is also something that was encouraged. But not only was memorization encouraged, there was this whole campaign to educate and teach people to read and to write. Because it now had transformed from a, it, it, it was transformed not only as an oral message but also a written message. Prominent and then another significant incident happened during the uh, rulership of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was the uh, successor of the Prophet peace be upon him. When the Prophet died, Abu Bakr took over the leadership of the Muslim community. So he was the first caliph. And what happened on, on, on one expedition, he sent 70 memorizers. Uh, they were requested, he was requested to send a group of 70 memorizers to a particular town, or area, or tribe to help teach them the verses of the Qur'an. But this was a trap, unfortunately, and, and they, were, they were ambushed along the way and all 70 of them were killed. And when the news came back to Abu Bakr and he realized that 70 memorizers had been killed, he instructed that a single book be prepared of that entire collection. And fortunately, at that time, paper uh, was, uh, was available from China for use in, in Medina. So he was the first to instruct that, taking all those uh, leather parchments and uh, scrolls and, and, and slates and so forth, to put it all in paper form. And he then passed over that entire copy, the copy, the first entire copy of the Quran in book form, he passed that on to his daughter Hafsa. May God be pleased with her. When he came to uh, a subsequent ruler, Uthman ibn Affan, he took over the leadership after Abu Bakr passed on. There, uh, because Islam started spreading, and there were actually seven dialects that were being used at the time in, in the Arabian Peninsula. So as Islam spread to tri uh, tribes uh, surrounding Medina and, and the uh, Arabian Peninsula, there were pronunciation disputes that, that, that crept in. So what uh, Uthman did was to protect the uh, veracity uh, of and authenticity of the original message. He ordered that the official edition be duplicated and sent to every major Muslim city. Because what people started doing on their own, they started copying from these, uh, from that leather bag, they started copying by themselves sections of the Quran. And he then instructed that all those copies be destroyed and that original uh, uh, copy from Hafsa be used as the template to make an official edition and it was that official edition that was then duplicated it is reported that seven copies were made of that official edition and they were sent to uh, seven uh, major cities in the Islamic Empire at that time and two of those copies, they are called Uthmani Qur'ans two of them exist today for scholars and students alike to investigate and they exist in the museums in Turkey and the Tashkent and that's a copy of the Tashkent so this is uh, uh, almost 1400 years ago, that copy of the Quran. On, on, your, on your left is the original, and on the right is a punctuated and vowelized version of exactly the same thing. To make it easier for us to, to uh, because it seems that we have gone through this period of decline. <laughs> because it was also an oral uh, transmission, the, the written form was, uh, was just a supplement to the oral transmission, so the vowels and punctuation didn't really matter. But it became a problem as uh, people relied more on the written form than the oral, the oral version. And then punctuation and, and vowels, the tashkil, uh, needed to be incorporated. Okay, just returning to some of the major themes again, in summary, the major themes of the Quran. There are three major themes. The absolute authority of God, and therefore the need for, for monotheism, uh, as opposed to uh, polytheism. The accountability of humans for their deeds, going back to what I mentioned before, that we were given the choice to submit or not to submit, and therefore we have to give an account of that choice that we made. The decision that we made, we, we are going to give an account for that on the Day of Judgment. And then the third is the impermanence of this life, that this life we are living is not, uh, it, it's not why uh, this world was created. This, the, this entire universe was not created for this, for this earth. It was created for the year after. So Muslims, like Christians and Jews, we believe in the year after. We believe that this earth is just a temporary abode where we are given that choice to make the decision that uh, we choose to make and then we will, we will live the life in the year after based on that decision that we make. 
So if we make the right decisions on this earth, we will live a life of happiness and bliss and certainty in the year after. Unfortunately, if we don't, if we choose not to, if we choose, choose to reject that invitation by God through His uh, prophets and His messengers and the, and the revelation that they uh, gave to us, if we choose to ignore it, choose to reject it, then unfortunately we have to suffer the consequences. So whether you, whether you believe in heaven and hell or not, this is the concept that uh, all believers believe in. Life after death and day of judgment. And this is common to Christians and Jews as well. There are some, uh, some differences when it comes to the concept of heaven and where it is and so forth and so forth. I'm not going to go into that. Um, the Quran can, can generally also be bro broken down into three thirds. One third uh, um, dealing with the next life, so the year after convincing people about the need for an accountability. Why? Because the question arises from, uh, from people who choose not to believe in the year after. Why is there a need for a year after? Why, why, should, why should there be a day of reckoning? Why should there be a day of, of accountability, a day of judgment? So the Quran spends one third of it convincing people of that reality. So for the students of logic and, and, and rationalism, I, I challenge you to go and look up those verses uh, about what the methods that the Quran uses to prove the existence of the life after death. And another third of the Quran deals with the prophets, previous prophets, uh, interfaith, relations and issues, the human experience and the people that we experience, and then the last third deal, deals with law. Uh, personal and social obligations. And then finally, before I finish, this is the Quran's challenge to us. This is the Quran's challenge to the doubters, to the skeptics, to the critics, uh, doubting uh, the authenticity and credibility of the Quran being the, 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 the final uh, uh, revelation from God in its, uh, in its revealed form. So this is the first verse. Now, this is from God Himself. Now, scholars, they will look at this challenge and they will comment on it as well. That no human will write a book. Uh, for example, Gary Miller wrote a, a small old booklet. He gave a presentation called uh, The Amazing Quran. He said, No author will write a book and then in the book make a statement to say, I challenge any reader who reads my book to find a mistake in it. And he will not find a mistake. He or she will not find a mistake in it. Right? Have you found a book like that? Has anybody read a book? Where the author challenges its readers to find a discrepancy, an error. I've written a book like that as a teacher, saying, This is my book of lectures. Yeah. If you find anything wrong with it, tell me, because we need to discuss it. I right. may be wrong, you may be right. Seems to me the logical response for a teacher to take to her students. And have you had your students uh, uh, come back to you with uh, some? Uh, Questions or concerns or errors or mistakes? Very rarely, but I got the chops soon afterwards, so now I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> Everything they paid the money for over the years has disappeared, so what notion of value does that bring forward? Yeah. They paid for it. Okay, the challenge is here is not to find an error, because as teachers and lecturers, yes, we need to do that, because we know that we are fallible and we're not perfect. And no teacher will make a claim, no professor uh, will make a claim that. He has perfect, or she has perfect knowledge of everything. So, but this challenge is different. This challenge is where God, Allah, says that, uh, go and look, do they not consider the Quran? Had it been from other than Allah, they surely would have found there in much discrepancy. So God is saying that even if you look, you will find nothing uh, in it that is incorrect. So what happened was a few years ago, I'm just going to use this as a simple example. Um, where Professor Keith Moore is a scholar in anatomy and the medical students generally tend to study his book uh, called Clinically Oriented Anatomy it's, uh, in his sixth edition and so forth. So they study his books on anatomy and he, he was uh, visiting Saudi Arabia one, one day and it was, uh, informed, uh, he was informed that there are specific verses in the Quran that refer to issues uh, related to embryology. So he was interested and he said, okay, show me those verses in the Quran. And uh, the verse that, uh, one of the verses that were first revealed to Prophet Muhammad B.S.B. upon him refers to the congealed blood, Alaqa. So, Prof, uh, Prof uh, Keith uh, Moore, and this is what he said, uh, this is what he said, what, what he's reported happened. He said that the Quran's description of the human being as a leech like clot, Alaqa, was new to him. But when he checked, uh, so what he did was he went back to his institution, his university, and he went to the Department of Yol, uh, Zoology and he asked him to show him uh, what a leech looks like. And when he saw what a leech looked like, and he compared it to one of the earliest stages of uh, the embryo, this is when the embryo cannot even be seen by the human eye. It has to be observed under the, uh, 
a microscope. Uh, he was amazed when he saw the similarity in the description of that particular stage of uh, the embryonic development. And then what he did was, he found that it was true, and so he added, he incorporated that description in his book. And those descriptions, by the way, were only reported uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. Another challenge by God is, Or do they say, he fabricated, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this is the claims that the critics at the time and subsequently have made about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he fabricated the Quran, that this message is a fabrication. But this is what God says, uh, do they say he fabricated the message? No, they have no faith. Let them then produce. If they say it's a fabrication, let them produce a similar fabrication. Let them forge a book like it. If they speak the truth. So this is another direct challenge from God. And then the challenge continues. So God then says, okay. And God knows no one will be able to produce a book like the Quran. So he said, okay. If you can't produce a whole book of the Quran, why don't you try to produce 10 chapters of it? And the smallest chapter, the shortest chapter of the Quran has how many verses? Three verses in it. So try to produce 10 chapters with three verses in each, uh, if, you, if you can. And then the final challenge is that the last verse, then God says, okay, you won't be able to do 10 chapters. Why, why not just come up with one chapter? And this, the shortest chapter is three verses. So finally, I'll finish my, my presentation. I'm sorry for taking uh, more of your time. Uh, but this is why we're here today. Uh, where, and and I, I chose this particular verse where Allah, God says, Ya bini Adam, O children of Adam. So God is talking to all of us. All of us. Because ultimately we are all one family. We all come from the same mother and father, Adam and Eve. So we're all related. You're all my brothers and you're all my sisters. And I'm, I'm yours likewise. We have chosen different paths, but God says, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, whenever they come to you, messengers from amongst you, rehearsing my verses, that is the revelation unto you, those who are righteous and mend their lives, those who are righteous and mend their lives, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. I thank you very much for your time. If they are any questions, we can, we can deal with that now. If anybody wants to sit outside, we can do that as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>